round of applause for our very first panelist, Professor Ibidapo Obe. Also joining the panel, we have Dr. Moise Banire. He was born on the 6th of October, 1966 in Lagos. He received his LLB, Master's and Doctorates of Law from the University of Lagos, focusing on the evolving alternative legal framework for land management in Nigeria. He was a senior lecturer of law at the University of Lagos from 1991 till 2010, lecturing in private and property law. He formed the United Action for Change, which serves as a pressure group and think tank with the drive to build a society where people are valued and treated equally and enjoy their rights as citizens. A round of applause for Dr. Muniz Banire. Now I'd like to call Toyosi Akerele Ogunstiji. She was named as Forbes, by Forbes as one of the 20 most powerful young women in Africa and is a social entrepreneur whose work is at the intersection of entrepreneurship, youth education and development, as well as public leadership. She is the founder and CEO of Rise Networks, Nigeria's leading social enterprise, whose mandate focuses on using tech innovation to create advocacy, skills empowerment, and learning opportunities for the inclusive growth of youth. Toyosi is an Edward Mason Fellow and has a Master's in Public Administration from Harvard University, the Kennedy School of Government. She also studies Strategic Management at the executive level at Cambridge University's Judge Business School and has a Certificate in Youth Inclusive Financial Services from the University of New Hampshire. She holds her certificate in Media Enterprise from the School of Media and Communications from Pan Atlantic University. Please, a round of applause as Toyo Siakerele Ogunshiji makes her way to the stage. Next, joining the panel, we have Mr. Emeka Izeze. He's a fellow of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs, Harvard University, Cambridge, Massachusetts. He's also the immediate past managing director and editor-in-chief of Guardian Newspapers Limited, in Nigeria. He studied business management at the prestigious Lagos Business School and also undertook leadership and development at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He was appointed editor of the Sunday edition of The Guardian in 1988 and in 1992 he became editor of the Daily Flagship newspaper. In 1999 he was appointed managing director and editor-in-chief of Guardian Newspapers, one of Nigeria's most respected newspapers. He is a board member of the West African Institute, a fellow of the 21st Century Trust England, and a member of NIPAD Business Group Nigeria, as well as a member of the Business Support Group. Please, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Emeka Izezi. And also joining the panel, Mr. Ebere Ongudiwe, He's a Nigerian political economist who resides in Abuja and is chairman of the O Analytics Research and Development Initiative. His undergraduate education was at the American College of Switzerland in 1979 and University of Science and Arts in 1980. He received a MS and PhD in political science from Florida State University. He is currently the chairman of Board of Trustees, Development Leadership Institute, Port Harcourt and is a member of the Governing Council of Igbenedan University in Okada, Edo State, and a member of the board of the Ojuku Center, Oweri, Imo State, as well as a distinguished fellow at the Center for Democracy and Development. Please, a round of applause for Professor Ebere Omodiwe. And moderating the session will be Professor Pat Utomi, but before that happens, we do have one more thing to do before the panel We'll be looking at reflection on democracy, private enterprise, development, and national competitiveness in Africa. This was meant to be presented by Dr. Lazarus Anagbazo, who's the president and CEO, East, Central, and West Africa of GE International Operations, Nigeria Limited. But sadly, he's not here, but he will be ably represented by Dr. Joyce Shingo. Wige, Executive Director at GE. Dr. Joyce, please make your way to the podium. And right after that, the panel will kick off.
Ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for Dr. Joyce as she makes her way. She's representing again uh, Dr. Lazarus Anakbazo, who's president and CEO East Central GE International Operations Limited. Let's give her a round of applause, please. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Bishop Cooker is just such a hard one to follow. I'm sure you all agree with me. I mean, after Your Excellency, um, General Yakubu Gowon has spoken, and the Minister of Liberia has spoken, and then Bishop Cooker, um, I, I, I guess the, 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 um, the organizers have a sense of humor putting me right after. Right, the topic... The topic I've been asked to talk about is democracy. Okay, okay. Is democracy, private enterprise, development, and national competitiveness. When I was asked to talk about this topic, I took a good look at the topic, and what came to my mind was national competitiveness is an outcome, development is an outcome, a thriving private enterprise is an outcome, but de democracy is the only driver. So the question is, how can this, this driver, democracy, drive us to get the qualified, um, the quality national outcomes we want? National competitiveness, development, and private ends. I'll step aside for a moment and say, everything here is exactly my opinion. There's a disclaimer. It's my opinion. It's not that of General Electric, neither is it that of Lazarus Ambazu. Um, so there is a famous... Um, joke that says that um, a mathematician, an accountant, and an economist went for an interview. And they were asked the question, what is two plus two? The mathematician said, two plus two, of course, is four. Right? And they said, are you sure? He says, of course, it's four. An accountant was asked, what is two plus two? And he thought for a moment, and he says, you know, it could be four plus or minus, right? When an economist was asked, he's asked the two plus two equals, and he says, you know, it all depends on what you want to do with the equals. Right, it's not exactly the same, depending on what profession you speak to. Right, for the purposes of our discussion, which is quite quick, actually, we will have a look at definition. The whole idea of the definition is to be able to provide us with context, so we agree on exactly what the definition of, of democracy is. Look here, we'll just take e examples of what, what some countries have done those that have practiced the sort of democracy we practice here, and those that have adopted other forms, of, um, other forms of democracy or other forms of government, right? And then we will have a look at, now, does it actually, this democracy they've practiced, does it actually give, us, give them the natural uh, quality outcome of development? We will have a look at what modern day refer to as indicators of development, which has to do with longevity of life, it has to do with quality of um, education, has to do with GDP. And to look at that, we will have, have a look at the Human um, Development Index. Now, we will refer to um, the UNDP, um, and then we will have a look at, we'll take a breath from that and try to answer the question, then we will actually determine, how, how, does democracy actually lead to national competitiveness? We will also look at the ranking as provided at the World Economic Forum to see if it actually does provide that um, answer. Then we will take a quick look, because you see most of the panelists are private sector panelists. We'll then say, does democracy actually breed a thriving private sector enterprise, net quality outcome of development? We will make our deductions, and hopefully at the end of it all, we'll come to what, you know, we'll try to answer the question and come to some sort of conclusion. Now, definition, Bishop Cook actually took us to definition, which was exactly what Ambassador um, Abraham Lincoln said, which is democracy is government for the people, by the people, of the people. Now, it's always important to look at the history of anything because the history gives you an indication of why did this come about. And let's not lose sight of history because it gives us a guidance as to where we're going. So the history tells us that it's actually a Greek word. It actually started in ancient Greece, and it was a product of um, um, a response to the concentration and abuse of leadership at the time. 
Now, this is key because we don't want that repeating itself. So if we choose to actually have a democratic system, we must remember that the rule is we don't want, there has to, this, we have to ensure that it doesn't repeat itself in terms of having an abused concentration of leadership. Then we will look at, now the next thing is, um, we talked about democracy here, and what came out when Bishop Cooker was talking is that he talked about different forms, oligarchy, aristocracy, but it might interest you to know that there's actually different variations of democracy based on ideology. So there is presidential democracy, there is um, authoritarian democracy, there is Islamic democracy, there is representative democracy, democracy, there is socialist democracy, all of them come under this big umbrella of democracy. But guess what the difference is? It's the ideology behind what the core value, you know, or the core values of the people that actually make for the variation of democracy they're talking to, they're talking about. Now take for example, when you talk about socialist democracy, socialist democracy is, pra is practiced most commonly by the Nordic countries. And the Nordic countries are like Sweden, Norway, and you all know that they have the best, highest, um, you know, HDI, highest ranking and competitiveness and all that. So there must be something we must learn from that, right? I mean, if they actually have their ideology in, in ingrained in whatever the democratic principles are, it might be something we might need to look out for. Again, there is the, like I said, there is the authoritarian, which is practiced in countries like Qatar and China. Now, um, now let's take a look at, um, let's, let's have a look at democracy and development. Democracy and development. I chose five examples, five different countries. I chose Venezuela because Venezuela has been in the news recently, right? It's supposed to be a democratic elected government, but recently we have, we have someone from the National Assembly, um, Juan Guaido, that actually named himself interim president, and guess what? He's getting all over the world. I also chose Brazil. Then, for countries that don't practice the typical type of democracy, sort of variation, I chose um, Singapore, China, and Qatar. Now, there's no real reason or logic to choosing this, but this is generally off cuff. And for these ones, what I found out is, in looking at them, to determine whether actually in trying to answer the question is, is democracy, does democracy give us the actual desired outcome of development? I looked at the longevity of people that live in these particular countries. And if we look at the ranking, what we found out for Venezuela, out of a total of 229 countries, Venezuela came 116, Brazil came 129, Nigeria came 178. Singapore was number three. Qatar was 56. China was 99. What does that tell us? So there's long expectancy in those countries than in the countries that practice the, the more classical form of democracy, like Nigeria, which is you know, Venezuela and um, Brazil, which is the presidential form of democracy. Now, we looked at the HDI, which is the Human Development Index, which kind of tells you, you know, the literacy level, how human beings are doing, education, the status, and all that. And we looked at a ranking as presented by the UNDP. And what came out again on top was Singapore was number nine, Qatar was 37, Nigeria was number 177. Now, again, we see a trend, right? We see that those countries that practice democracy that is slightly tweaked to their ideology seem to be coming out tops in the ranking. Now, if we're trying to answer the question, does democracy actually breed development? Now, we looked at the final one, which has to do with GDP. We all know GDP, right? GDP per capita tells us the higher it is, of course, the better economic welfare of the citizens. Again, Qatar ranked highly, Singapore, Qatar was number one, Singapore was number four, China went up, Nigeria was the last with Venezuela and Brazil. So there is a common trend we're beginning to see. So if you're beginning to ask yourself, what's the link between democracy and development, you can begin to say, hmm, maybe there is a link between democracy and development. Maybe we should expect some quality outcome. But you say, you know what, let's think about it a little bit more. Let's look at national competitiveness. You might probably say to me, 
Joyce, give me more facts, right? I need more facts to be able to come to that conclusion. So we looked at national competitiveness. What is national competitiveness? Some of you might ask. The national competitiveness was derived by the, um, by the World Economic Forum and is indexed with 12 pillars. These 12 pillars include institutions, infrastructure, microeconomic stability, health, education, higher education, financial market, technical readiness, innovation, and so many others. We looked at the ranking again, and consistently, what came out clearly was that Singapore was number two, China followed as 28, um, Qatar as well, right up there, Nigeria, Brazil, and Venezuela were at the bottom. Now you might begin to think, maybe there is actually a link between democracy and, and quality outcomes of development and national competitiveness. But before I, before I finish up, let's look at the last one, which has to do with, does democracy, is, is, does democracy guarantee um, a thriving, um, a thriving um, private sector? Now, private sector, when you look at all of this, right, private sector varies from region to region, depending on natural resources, depending on cost of production. So a private you know, businessman determines where he wants to go and how he wants to do the business based on all of those labor and all of those issues economists will know better. But one underlying factor and one clear factor is that there is a categorical, um, it, it, there is no gain saying that the quality of leadership has a direct bearing on a thriving private sector. The reason is this, and it doesn't require, you know, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. A quality leadership actually does provide the enabling environment. It makes the policies, it enforces the policies, it ensures those adequately in, in, um, to head the agencies. Does, so I guess it just behoves, or it's, it's, a natural, it's a natural expectation that if quality leadership is key to a thriving environment, then it, there is a direct correlation between an enabling environment and the quality of leadership. So it brings to the forefront the fact that what sort of system do we operate that would necessarily throw out the, the, the candidates that would actually vie for these positions to kind of get us closer to the quality outcomes that we are searching for. Now, I would use this opportunity to say that, you know, um, there is probably, there is, it can arguably be said that for innovation and to thrive in a system, there is an argument that could be said for restructuring. Because when you restructure, there is a tendency for, for the power to move away from the center and development of different regions in the country to be able to pull our resources together and bring everyone up to the, up to the top. But that is my view. Now, what's the deduction from all of this we can see? Democracy can be good, but it all depends on how you use it. What we noticed was that most African countries, we talked about Nigeria, but most African countries were like Nigeria, who were huddled at the bottom of the ranking table, be it for HDI or be it for national competitiveness. But most African countries also, in looking at some of their constitutions, actually have similar constitutions, like that of Nigeria, right, which is a federal system. So one thing that was clearly missing from all of this is what we saw that was applicable to those who seem to be ranking properly, which was that China, Qatar, Singapore, there was an ideology which they instilled into the democratic principles they were practicing, still calling it democracy, but giving them the desired outcome that placed their nation in a high position of national competitiveness. So it might be something we might wish to consider for our nation, Nigeria. In, 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 and you know, it just goes to buttress, there is actually a saying which says that, um, there is a saying to the effect that the people without knowledge of their past history, origin, or culture are like trees without roots. So if the Singaporeans or the Qatarians or the Chinese actually did have this at the back of their mind, and they actually did remember their history and sort of inculcated it in their principles, maybe, maybe that is the way we really should be going other than just adopting hook, line, and sinker, um, the Western form of um, democracy. I would conclude by saying that 
Um, African countries, I'll conclude by saying that African countries, having adopted democracy, dem adopted it hook, line, and sinker. Now, the quality of leadership, particularly in Nigeria, as I've enshrined in our constitution, and um, Bishop Cook actually alluded to it, said that for you to actually hold an elected office, all that you need for qualification is that you have a certain age, 30, 35, in case of President, 40, and just have school cert. It doesn't matter how many universities have been thrown up since the constitution was risen, but just have school cert and just belong to a political party. It gives no reference to any form of education, no reference to any form of experience, no reference to any form of taxes that you need to pay, no reference to any form of management or kiosk. You know, he talked about David in the Bible. And guess what? David was prepared for the job which God had actually asked him to do. Da David had been in the forest. He had actually killed a bear. He had actually had a lion. And that is why the king, I believe, kind of said, you know what? We will give you a chance. Here is my, here is my armor. Wear it. If David didn't have this history, this track history, which was known to all, I don't think they would even as much as have given him a chance. And so I think that it's not too much to actually expect this of our leadership. Again, Pastor Bishop Kuka alluded to the fact that you have a driver and you want to employ a driver. Guess what? You ask him for his track records. You have a cook. You want to know, have you done this before? Where did you do it? Your child goes to school. You want to know. You've passed to the next class, so it means that you must have completed all the requirements for education at a particular level, right? Before he gets elevated to the next class. Somehow, our constitution is completely silent on this. So if you have been home sitting down, you know, you know an arm drop or whatever, you know, you guess what? Election, you just come up and run for the election. If you're able to, you know, muscle your way through, then you become the leader. I think there is something to say that democracy, there is a link between democracy and a thriving leadership, and it actually, and a thriving private sector, and it actually behoves on the leadership to ensure that we have a system that is fair, not just fair, but a system that is capable of throwing out fairly decent candidates that can actually vie for positions that will probably give us the desired outcome. Now, in conclusion, just one last thing to say, um, which is that, there is actually um, a quote from somebody, Tom Stophard, and he said, it is not voting that is democracy, it's the counting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Joy Shingo Iwege, um, she is the executive director at GE, here to represent um, the president, CEO, East, Central, and West Africa, GE International Operations, Nigeria Limited. Now, very quickly, just before the panel kicks off, we would like to uh, take a look at um, reviewing the book that Professor Pat Utomi uh, wrote. The book is titled, Why Not? Citizenship, State Capture, Creeping Fascism, and Criminal Hijack of Politics in Nigeria. Mr. Chido in Wakami, please come to the stage. You will be reviewing the book very, very briefly so we can hand things over to the panel. I know that the audience is anxious to hear the panel's thoughts. Please don't forget, you all have an opportunity to ask questions and make contributions for the panel. So please write your questions down, get them ready. We will ask that you make your questions as short and concise as necessary, and I will be very strict on that. So. Uh, get your questions ready, your contributions for the panel as well. Please a round of applause, Mr. Chido Nwankame, as he reviews Why Not. Good morning, all. Why Not? A 2019 book published by CVL Press Limited. I titled this review, A Return to Pamphleteering. Patrick Utomi has played many roles in the public space in Nigeria. Professor, entrepreneur, youth influencer, one of the poster boys of Lagos at 50, public relations icon, and politician. In consequence of his last role as a politician and gubernatorial candidate, Utomi has now taken on the role of pamphleteer. 
Pamphleteers were the foremost opinion leaders who rose up historically in times of crisis to broadcast the writer's opinion, articulate a political ideology, and mobilize citizens. Pamphleteers arose in times of political unrest, such as the French Revolution. Notable pamphleteers include Thomas Paine, John Milton, and our own Namde Azikiwe, starting with Renaissance Africa. Why not? Citizenship, state capture, creeping fascism, and criminal hijack of politics in Nigeria, a very long title, provides the reader with a vivid picture of the crisis of values at the heart of the Nigerian political and leadership experience, its causes, and why Nigeria is worse off for it. The trigger for the book is the recent involvement of Prof. Tommy in the effort to clinch the ticket of the All Progressives Congress to contest the seat of governor of Delta State. It went very badly. <laughs> we learn in this book that the problem is not losing the ticket, but seeing the rot that is the process of political choice in our political parties. Utomi was a founding member of the APC and one of its key human resources for delivering its impressive manifesto in 2015. What happened to that manifesto is one of the indicators of the crisis of trust in our politics. The central thesis of why not is that the pursuit of private gain rather than common good dominates Nigerian politics and makes it incapable of delivering positive returns to citizens across our 36 states. Utomi asserts in support of this thesis, and I quote, across the country, governors are raping their states and then deciding who will continue the rape, often on their behalf, when term limits stop their direct romp. What we must not shy away from admitting is that most Nigerian political parties are in the firm grip of criminal elements who see access to public office either as a business from which to reap big returns, a path to, to totally dominate others, the new fascism, or as an arena of transactions for fully personal trading objectives. The common good features very little in their thinking, except as rationalization of purpose, even when goal displacement is so palpable. That Nigerian civil society and media are yet to comprehend the depths to which their politics have fallen and to fashion a fight back to rescue the Nigerian people is probably the big question for now in Nigeria. Why not run through nine chapters? Chapter titles speak to the issues the book covers. They include a haunting metaphor, back to the beginning, greed and fetish ways versus issues and fixing problems, the complicit middle, and a few good men. Other titles are The Gideon Project, Finding Grass and Its Roots, A Path from Serfdom, Reclaiming a Lost but Blessed Land, and Why and Why Not. In Back to the Beginning, the author assays to establish his credentials and long interest in public affairs. It includes roles in students' unionism, culminating in bringing a minister to speak to students at the University of Nigeria, years as a prolific thought leader, essayist, and newspaper columnist, producer and presenter of Patito's Gang, and president of the military era concerned professionals. Utomi asserts that there is a need to wake Nigeria up. Concerned professionals and other pro-democracy groups hastened the return of the military to their barracks and the reclamation of democracy for Nigeria. But he recounts one recurring lamentation. Quote, the democracy we fought for has set life up to imitate art, as it mirrors Fela Nicola Kokuti's mockery of the experience as them all crazy. Unfortunately, the concerned professionals and their ick across the country failed to transmute into political parties leaving the space for persons who played no role in the struggle and lacked the values to propel the country forward with policies and programs based on vision. He says that is where the problem started with our current democracy. 
Chapter 4, the complicit middle is recommended reading. It is provocative. It laments the apathy and dysfunction of middle class Nigeria. Study after study shows that the middle class is pivotal to growth in most societies. Natalia Chon, Rana Hassan, and Mehmet Ulubasoglu in 2011 analyzed data from 72 countries in a study for the Asian Development Bank. The role of the middle class in economic development, what do cross-country data show? And the evidence is that the middle class propels economic growth. Other studies show that the middle class does this by promoting better governance and right policy choices. Utomi says the Nigerian middle class is passive rather than active on the issues that propel societal growth and economic development. He groups under the middle class, tropical gangster in politics, the tropical gangster in politics, that's his name for all of those kinds of people who are playing there, academics and intellectuals, students, religious leaders, and the business community. You must read his narrative about the business community. The business community, the auto charges, quote, take over in feigned neutrality, they take cover in feigned neutrality to collaborate with whoever is in power and quietly fund them against the people's will. The business community is, belongs to a party called AJIP, any government in power. Utomi calls for a reform in the middle class attitude, which is that attitude which sees politics as the arena for only people pursuing their narrow self-interest. This same attitude believes that politicians should be mocked, as they mocked him, poked fun at, and genuinely dismissed as having no redemptive value. The result is that the typical Nigerian youth of today feels hopeless and wants out. Why not paint on a broad canvas? The book is a major contribution to studies in Nigerian and African political science, sociology, political economy, and mass communication. Why not exemplifies Walter Fisher's narrative paradigm theory in using storytelling to good effect. Narrative paradigm states that all meaningful communication is in the form of storytelling. Experiences and other factors from the past influence the process. Why not is a coherent account with a high degree of fidelity and deploys the tools of narrative to present an account using split screen rather than linear storytelling. The book adds to the impressive corpus of works featuring the author's engagement with the Nigerian condition. Works by this renowned professor of political economy include Managing Uncertainty, Competition and Strategy in Emerging Economies, The Art of Leading, Open Secrets of Leadership Effectiveness, and Values and Leadership for Sustainable Development. Others are Gold in Thought, a collection of Pat Utomi's views on the economy, politics, and social system, and Keeping Faith, the making of an icon. There are also Business Angel as a Missionary, Reflections of an Economic Growth Activist, Nigeria's Political Economy and the Courtship with Poverty, and Critical Perspectives on Nigerian Political Economy and Management. Why not should provoke quote, debates and the marketplace of ideas, the presence of which Utomi says would serve as an antidote to the present decline in Nigeria. To escape unrushing anarchy, the book recommends Nigeria should leapfrog initiatives in education and healthcare, government focused on the people and the common good, a strategy based on dominating the value chains of factor endowments where Nigeria has an obvious latent comparative advantage and creating citizenship culture that breeds patriots. Happy birthday, Prof. Tony. Thank you. I guess we'll transit quickly to a conversation here. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen,
uh, let me begin, and I think this is appropriate here, by giving thanks to Emeka Opara, who has done remarkably well to facilitate a good part of today's program, including minding our Liberian friends. Emeka, thank you. But uh, we're here, and I will begin with the Enfant Terrible himself, Dr. Muiz Banire. <laughs> really, truly, I just want us to all quickly, in three, three minutes, address the theme. Is democracy making life better in Africa? And then I'll come back with specific questions. Uh, so Dr. Banire will start. I, just, I don't want you to be linear. So I'll jump from Dr. Banire to Mr. Emeka Izeze, who actually presented a paper at Harvard on this subject only a few months ago. So we'd like him to reflect again on that, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. All other courses is duly extended. Well, I think the topic itself enters a presumption that uh, democracy possesses to deliver some form of uh, welfareism which I'm not too sure that that is the correct representation of what democracy is all about. Maybe at best, we take it as a structure or a system of governance on its own. But beyond that, if we assume without conceding that democracy is supposed to engender some form of welfareism, then we must look at the other parameters that must go with it. Because before you can actually have, before Africans' life can be better, or the economy or the well-being generally, certainly some other things must happen like uh, Bishop Kuka said. For example, I would imagine that democracy on its own will not certainly better the life of Africa, but you need good governance to deliver on that one. And for you to have good governance, certainly there must be good leaders. To have good leaders, you come back to the issue of democracy again or the election of your leaders. Now, from the presentation by uh, a doctor, the last speaker, uh, you will see that democracy is not indicative of good governance. It's not synonymous with it in whatever form. She gave us an example of uh, um, Qatar, for example. UAE is there, China is there, and a host of others. We are, for, to a large extent, you will say the people are much better off than most of us in this part of the continent. And there you cannot, strictly speaking, say that they practice democracy really in the way that we conceive it here uh, today. But if you look at the electoral democracy in Africa, maybe by the time you take off about less than 10 countries that seems to have some semblance of credible election, all others are challenged when it comes to election itself. So I want the election a challenge. The implication is that you are not likely to have good leaders that will cater for the welfare of their people. So in summary, at the end of the day, you are far off from being well off or from being better. So, so it's really about the process, about whether the democratic process as we practice it uh, results in the emergence of good leaders. But it's also about accountability and how you can hold whoever comes out of the process accountable. We probably need to engage all of this as we go down. Um, Emeka? Yeah. Thank you. I, I think as a process, I think we can agree that democracy has been making steady progress. And I think to that extent it's making some impact for the better in the lives of Africans. I'm talking generally. It's always very convenient to go continental and leave your country. It's something that uh, Pat knows too well. And even here, we have elections regularly. We have a constitution. We quote and unquote subscribe to the rule of law. We, we protect and defend civil liberties. All these are yardsticks measuring democracy. In other words, if you want to have a society where these don't exist, the lot of the people will be worse. So to that extent, you say that in Africa, we seem to be making some progress. But Kofi Annan, it was, who once said that democracy really is not just about 
voting every four or every five years. It's also about how you conduct yourself, even if you were originally voted to be there. And wh what does it mean to the people? Look, because we are many, I, I take one aspect. I think that where democracy has failed us, and I mean, I'm talking of Nigeria now, it's the same thing can be replicated all over Africa, is that we expect too much from our leaders. Father Kuka touched on that. Take President Buhari, for instance. He gave a speech, May 29, 2015. I belong to everybody, I belong to nobody. And everybody gave it a coloration that they wanted it to possess. But because it's our business to also look and add other, other dynamics in your uh, analysis, we recognize that the man was saying, don't expect what you are used to having. I cannot do it. Because he himself, he was supposed to bring change, but he was already a change man. He was older in 2015 than he was in 1984. He had dropped the garb of general, which he had in 1984, before 2015. He was no longer a general, he was now something else. And people don't understand what that means. The mentality is changing. The attitude is changing. And Nigerians were expecting change to come. And we started warning that one month into the tenure of the administration that we will not get everything everybody is expecting. But it wasn't, it wasn't politically enough for the APC or for other political, other civil society groups to rise and moderate the expectations of Nigerians. So what, and it's not only he, it was exactly the same thing with Good Luck Jonathan. The first trip Good Luck Jonathan paid, the first trip he made to Lagos, he hadn't been sworn in after winning the election. People literally, no kidding, people literally queued up on both sides of the airport road, the length and breadth of that road, waiting to see Good Luck Jonathan. That's how it used to be in the old days. And I said our uh, expectation from these Nigerians is way higher than what they're going to get. By the way, we also and came to the conclusion that between the, the last president and the present president, they're not really much that is different. They're both outsiders to the power blocks of their regions. They're both loners. They're both people with very limited reach in the society, they're both going to depend on a small coterie of people to run the government, and they're both going to make mistakes. And you, do, you really don't need to be a genius to come to those conclusions. I think whoever wins in 10 days' time must begin to moderate our expectations so that we don't always come back four years on to come to this mourning condition that we haven't quite made progress. As a process, we have made progress. But is it touching people? It's not because mostly people were expecting what they're never going to get. I will comment on some other aspects of this. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Now, this, but big question, is it about process? Why should we go through a process that doesn't make our life better? What the, what's, what's the use of democracy if I'm worse off as a person? There are nuanced statements like came from Bishop Kuka. I don't care if I feel nice, but I'm about to die of poverty. If some nice, strong man will ensure that I live well. Isn't that what most people say? Now, I'm trying to challenge, I'm trying to provoke. What's the point of worrying about process if we are worse off? Let me take it from a specific angle. Poor people are typically excluded. Inclusion is about getting them to be part of it. A few weeks ago, my wife and I were at the wedding, and somebody beside us was com com commenting. And this fellow said that at the University of Benin in the 80s, you could see the boys from the poorest families. They used to wear say, plastic shoes or something like that. Those boys eventually became the ones that went into government in 99, took over a state like Delta. His explanation, his explanation was that 
Delta is so bad because their poverty mindset affected the government. My, my thinking is completely different. If you came from poverty, you should use her power to make sure there is no more poverty. However, there is logical theoretical explanation in law. 19th century France, Frederick Claude Bastiat in his famous monograph, The Law, essentially argues that law is an instrument of legal plunder. You use the law to plunder. And that the worst thing that can happen to a country is for the excluded to imagine that entering power is to share in plunder rather than changing things. And what seems to have happened to Nigeria is that those who were excluded, most of the wrong people, entered in 99 and wanted to share in plunder. And Nigeria has been in free fall. Tell us, what do you think of that? Happy birthday, Professor Patu Tommy. Um, you know, this is a very controversial topic. I, I don't know if I want to be politically correct or if I want to say exactly how I feel, just to safeguard my own future political ambition. <laughs> <laughs> um, is democracy making life better in Africa? I think about that in the context of development. Uh, when I think about that in the context of development, what I see in my country is the development of underdevelopment. The reason I say that is that we're such a rich country, we're such a poor people, we live in a country of deep-seated ironies where the richest man out of Africa comes from our country, but we're also the headquarters of poverty. Hello, citizens of the poverty capital of the world. <laughs> now, I feel like development doesn't need democracy. What I think that development needs is a set of well-structured, responsible institutions that are overseen by public administrators who understand transparency, dedication, commitment, and patriotism. However, the problem with Nigeria is that our public administrators have been, have been oppressed and rigged into a system where they are supposed to submit to a retinue of rogues and criminals such that the people that you put in the systems who are meant to do the jobs are supposed to then submit to politicians who don't think about the future. And the reason I say that is, I don't know if I want to be controversial, but if I think about the countries who are, that have experienced incredible levels of development, they are not democracies. Europe is a monarchy. Eu European, a lot, the UK, for example, is a monarchy, forgive me, not Europe, led by kings and queens and emperors through time. Think about Dubai, a country that at the time that Dubai became, that Nigeria became a federation in 1960, Dubai was still a desert. It was still seven emirates. You think about countries like Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew's records don't show him to be a Democrat. You then think about countries come to Africa and bring it to Rwanda, Nobody would tell you that Paul Kagame is such an excellent Democrat. Take it upstairs and go to China and Germany. Those are countries that are witnessing the fourth industrial revolution already, artificial intelligence, robotics, the internet of things, and people are going to school. We're building, we are living in a country where we're upholding wealth without work and politics without principle. And then you ask me as a 35-year-old if democracy is working, making lives better. I think about my country as poor people, and I think about 80 million people living below the poverty line. And I wonder if they care about the English we're speaking in this room. What I want to really see is the impact of the conversation of, that we're having here, and how it's going to go to the streets, so that when we vote in 10 days, we will make decisions that will not be 1,000 naira per year, which means that you pay 4,000 naira per vote. And the reason I say that is because 
We seem to have these standalone conversations all the time where we talk about 4,000 or 5,000 higher votes. Professor Patu told me the parts of this country where the bribe they receive in return for their votes are bathroom sleepers and toothpaste. Those are communities. I sit on the Presidential Committee for the Victims of Terrorism Support Fund. And so I, I go to places where you don't hear about, like Askara Uba, like Buniyadi, like Michika Madagali. I was, in, I was in Takum in Taraba the other day. And these are people who, when the sun hits the ground, they're walking bare feet. Those ones don't need 4,000 naira. They need bathroom slippers, and they will vote for the biggest criminal in that community. And these are the realities that face us. So when you ask me if I want a democracy, what I really want is someone, is leaders who, who understand what public administrative systems are. And, and, and those public administrative systems have to submit and be built into institutions that stay through time, such that you cannot think, you cannot begin to make a case for democracy, like countries like France, that became democracies in 1789, but did not begin to establish and experience stable democracies till, till about 1871, just almost about 100 years. Now, the, I will reframe the question and ask, what has democracy done for the poor people of my country? And then I'll come back. Well, thank you. Thank you so very much. I think it's uh, I, I, I think that it, a necessary follow-on is, is it not possible? Because there are so many benefits that come from this democracy, as has come from listening to the president of Liberia, as has come from Bishop Kuka's statement, is it not possible to make the process work to produce the kinds of people who will lead like those people who have led in those countries that don't seem like bureaucracies. That's uh, everybody. But but you see, mm. sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll go to Professor Oye. Who has not been a Democrat? As a vice chancellor, he's an oppressor. They have such powers. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, happy birthday. Um, you know, as I sit down here and I listen, and I said, perhaps the problem is that the definition of democracy which I was taught in civic class in about 1956-57 is still what is pervading. Democracy basically is about inclusion. See, that is the problem. And when democracy was actually being touted by the great American, as uh, uh, Bishop Cooker told us, it presumes equality, equal opportunity in terms of especially education. As long as we don't give education priority to make sure that everybody gets qualitative education in a society whereby out of 180 million, we have confirmed, it's probably more than that, that 13.5 million children, in spite of the free feeding, etc., etc., they're out of school. You are not going to get democracy. In a society whereby in the process, in the process of governance, you don't respect merit, where you do things in terms of your tribal connections. Sometimes I ask myself, if all these great Nigerians, somebody was talk, talking to me about Ogunlesi just this morning. If the United States of America says, you kill them, I, I want to pick you, I want somebody from Edo State, somebody who's been in, even within Edo State, I don't want to Shekiri. And they use that to admit us, as it were, as citizens of the United States. You think Nigeria, United States will be as great as this? Why is it that they are not discriminatory? Why is it that anything we want to do, what is most important 
is where you are. So we need, number one, if I have my way, and I don't have a candidate yet, my candidate will have to promise that they are going to scrap the Federal Character Commission. That is cheating Nigerians. This system can work. How come we have now? Let's look at it. ASU has been on strike for so long. People have not been going to the universities. Some of them have even forgotten as to what learning is all about. We are going to push them out. As soon as they give us money, we'll push them out. They'll go to your primary schools, they'll go to your secondary schools, they'll go to your hospitals, and they'll be practicing. Why do you expect to squeeze water from stone? So what I'm trying to say is that if we do this process properly, whereby we see inclusion. I've not seen anybody that has been recalled in spite of all the process. Either somebody will go to court that the list is forged, or either they will put something there. So I think we have to be, we have to come to reality, uh, Pat, that yes, democracy is great, but it has to be pushed under certain conditions. And that's what she's saying, I agree with yes. you. If I go out there and I keep on asking this type of question, they will just laugh. It's either you give me my 5,000 naira or you just get out of my sight. That is what we turned our own inclusion to. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very soon we'll find out from uh, Dr. Banire why he allowed this to happen to the political party that he was legal advisor of. But, uh, but we'll come back to him very soon. Uh, but, but really, truly, we, we're talking about education. If we go back to even the American Constitution, people were not allowed to vote for a long time because it was figured that they didn't have the capacity to make choice. And so property was used as a basis for defining your learning, your capacity to make choice. And so people began to get included when it was felt that it made sense for them to reason between options. The universal adult suffrage idea in a country of uneducated people doesn't seem to make enough sense. Even though you, their rights are important, but these issues need to be engaged. And when people can't think more clearly, it's easy to return to the lager, to use measures like ethnic group and stuff to make a decision. And so, Professor Berangudiwe, who has um, lived in America and voted there and is now voting in Nigeria, <laughs> may want to give us a bit of his own reflection on this challenge of uneducated people who can be bought and democracy. Okay, thank you, Pat. And um, I think that what I want to do is to give the position of scholarship on this question that you read. There have been many, many scholarly work on the relationship between democracy and growth. Whether democracy promotes economic growth or not. Voluminous studies, but the result is that there is no consensus. There is no agreement on the issue of democracy promoting economic growth. But a recent study on the case of Africa south of the Sahara, I don't like to call it sub-Saharan Africa, something insulting about that, but on that particular issue, there has been found a positive relationship on the effect of democracy on economic growth. And not to forget that this, our democracy that we're talking about, is a recent phenomenon. It is something that started at the end of the Cold War. Before then, there were frequent military governments, autocracies, and apartheid in South Africa. 
in the subcontinent here. It's only after the Cold War released everybody that democracy started. Our own in 1999 and the rest of it. So that's one trend. The trend has been since the Cold War ended, democratization started. And if you look at the literature, you will also find that it is within that period that another trend started. And that trend was economic growth. Our growth was rising. And uh, so there is parallel movement, dual movement, democratization this way, and growth coming. Up to the last administration, we reached in this country a level of up to six to seven percent of growth. But all that was growth without development. So that relationship exists. There is another relationship that has also been found in the literature. And that is that there is a distinction between democratization and consolidation of democracy. When democratization is happening, the relationship is faster in economic growth. But it remains more steady, more predictable, if you have consolidated your democracy. The studies have found that countries that held on to their democracy uninterrupted for about 15 years up to, 19, up to 2012 did very well in economic growth. Countries such as Ghana, countries such as Benin here in our neighborhood, Botswana, South Africa, who held on to their democracies that they found from the end of of, um, from the end of, um, of the Cold War. So the issue that this symposium is addressing is an important one. It's an important one because it has been in academic literature. But in the specific case of Nigeria, I, I think I've been listening to talk all day and there is a lot of attributions to democracy that does not belong to it exclusively. The president of uh, Liberia's paper rightly praised the rise of President Weir under a democratic situation. But the point is that there are people also coming from very humble backgrounds under military rule <laughs> that became heads of state. Yeah. One of them is sitting here, our president. <laughs> yes, he wasn't the son of a millionaire and he through professionalism and achievements in his own chosen field, was able to be recognized and become a president. And even in Liberia, Sergeant Doe, we know, also became head of state. And there's so, so many of those exist. So too much attribution to democracy is what is uh, burdening that concept. Because it is not a bad concept in and of itself. Because what does it do? It guarantees you individual liberty. Is that a bad thing? It guarantees you equality under the law. Is that a bad thing? So just because the Cold War ended and democracies were coming on board and we started talking about, econ about democratic dividends, everybody now puts it on the shoulder of democracy if everything is going wrong in their own polity. But in Nigeria, the problem is not democracy. The problem is the system under which the democracy we have is operating. That's a and that system is our federalism. Okay. It is the problem. It is not accidental that people are shouting for restructuring. Not to forget, Nigeria's federalism is not based on any theoretical foundation. It is simply based on fear. The fear of each other. Fear of domination. That's what our, our federalism is based on. 
unlike in the case of America, which you asked me to say something about. American federalism is based on checking the federal power. That's what their federalism is all about. It is a system of checking the power of the national government. So you divide the power so that other units will also have power. As a matter of fact, when they first divided their power, the states had more power than the federal government, right? That's when they had confederation. And when they found that that system was weakening the national government, such that it may not be able to protect the nation if faced by other countries in a hostile situation. They pushed for restructuring. And then they restructured their government so that they now take more power from the confederate subnationals. Yes. And then brought it to the center, making the center a little bit stronger than it was before. What we have today is a direct opposite of that. We concentrate huge powers in the hands of the center where there is no capacity to manage anything. Well, I, I think it's a very uh, interesting direction to travel. Uh, perhaps General Gowan may give us uh, some insights into the conversations, uh, but we won't come yet, sorry, General. In 1967, that led to the 12-state structure and the ultimate weakening of Nigerian uh, uh, federalism. But Really, the, uh, an important point to raise, and I, I, I returned to Dr. Bani Re before, uh, uh, welcoming the one and only Femi Falano. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, you know, I, in my early remarks, I talked about tribes, moral tribes. Sometimes we exaggerate certain things in Nigeria. When we talk about the June 12 crisis, for example. People talk about Nadeko. You know, history has been so distorted. People who were hiding in London have now become the heroes <laughs> of, uh, of, uh, of June 12 struggle. When those of us who were shot on the streets of Lagos are uh, forgotten. But the point I'm trying to make is that what responded in 1993 was not an ethnic tribe, it was a moral tribe. If I want to recall the concerned professional story, I, not a Yoruba person, started the process, and I can name the leaders of the concerned professionals. Nadeko, the core leaders of Nadeko were Bitu Kiwe, Ndubisi Kano, and then the general, the Inka Debayos and Co were added to them. And that was Nadeko. These were moral tribes. Why can a moral tribe not arise and reform our political parties so that people who can come through them are people who can lead the people away from poverty that we see today? You, as legal advisor of APC, what did you do Former. to make sure that that could happen? Former. Well, I'm sure that you have captured 